Um, welcome to, to uh, this talk about the Taliban and negotiations. Uh, this is a critical paper. My name is Ben Conable. Uh, I'm with the RAND Corporation. Uh, I'd like to thank the New America Foundation and the ICSR research team, sitting off to my right here, for inviting me to take part uh, in what I think is a, is a very important event. I personally am not an expert on Afghanistan, but I've been leading a research team examining the Afghan Peace and Reconciliation Program for the past uh, several years, and I've done some work on irregular warfare. Uh, so I hope to contribute a little bit to the discussion uh, in the Q&A se session after they get a chance to have their say here. The timing of this report, I think, could not be more fortuitous. So at the risk of becoming a Rory Stewart uh, soundbite on saying uh, at the TED Talk, um, this is a critical year for Afghanistan. You've probably heard that uh, at least 11 times uh, or 12 times before. But I think it was probably true every single time. Uh, the negotiations are now an intrinsic part of the NATO strategy to draw down in Afghanistan, um, to bring the war there, if not to a close, at least to a politically acceptable uh, low boil. Uh, talking to the Taliban compliments and also advances arguments that were made by Mitch Ambassador Mitchell Reese uh, in his book, Negotiating with Evil. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Um, and I think uh, Mitchell uh, sent a message saying that he concurred with the findings of the report. I can't speak for him, though. Uh, like Reese, the authors of Talking with the Taliban, Talking to the Taliban, questioned many of the basic assumptions that have undergirded the coalition approach to negotiations since 9/11, <coughs> and probably before that as well. This report provides what I believe to be the most complete and updated history of negotiations with the Taliban, and it also delivers objective and compelling analysis. And I found it uh, particularly helpful that they wove the analysis through the document. So that was that was uh, it made it an interesting read. Uh, most importantly, it addresses critical questions about negotiations in general, as negotiations apply to irregular warfare, negotiating with insurgents, and then also about the end game for the coalition in Afghanistan. I picked up three threads that I thought were really interesting. One, is there, is there an inherent or intrinsic value in negotiation with insurgents? Or has Afghanistan given us good reason to question what I think has become a general assumption about negotiation, that there's just some good to talking with people? Reese also asks that question. How does the United States, a country that perhaps necessarily cannot speak with one voice, communicate a clear and firm negotiating position? So we have senators and congressmen and secretaries visiting Afghanistan and Pakistan, delivering different messages. It's very difficult for us to maintain a consistent, solid theme and negotiating position. How do you do that? How can any counterinsurgent negotiate with a multifaceted insurgency, and how, and how does a weak central government for the host nation in this case, further complicate this effort. So we have three distinguished speakers. Uh, first, Ambassador Omar Samad off on, on the far right here is the founder and president of Silk Road Consulting based in Virginia. He was a senior Afghan expert in residence with the Center of Conflict Management at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. from 2012 to 2013. Prior to this, he served in Afgan as Afghanistan's ambassador to France and also as the ambassador to Canada. He was the spokesperson for the Afghan Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kabul and the Director General, Information and Media Divisions from 2001 to 2004. Professor Peter Newman, immediately to my right here, is a professor of security studies at the Department of War Studies, King's College, London. He serves as director of the International Center for the Study of Radicalization, ICSR, which he founded in early 2008. Newman has co-authored or authored, or co -authored five books, including Old and New Terrorism and the Strategy of Terrorism with MLR Smith. He's also written extensively on Northern Ireland peace process and negotiations with terrorists. And then in the middle here is Ryan Evans. He's assistant director at the Center of the National Interest, a PhD candidate at King's College London, Department of War Studies. So we have a heavy King's College contingent up here. I'm also in that program. And an associate fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization and Political Violence. From 2010 to 2011, Ryan worked as U.S. Army's Human Terrain Systems uh, in Afghanistan, in southern Afghanistan, where he was embedded as a social scientist. He's a fellow at the Inter-University Seminar on the Armed Forces and Society, and he's the editor-in-chief of War on the Rocks, which is a website that I think had its release today? Just today, Just yeah. today. okay. A new web publication on war and foreign affairs launching in July of 2013. So without further ado, please. Hi, um, first I just want to thank Peter uh, Bergen and Jen Rowland for organizing this event, and I also want to acknowledge our co-authors uh, who are in London, so they couldn't, couldn't be here. John Bew, Martin Frampton, and Marissa Porges. Um, I'm not going to summarize the whole report, because it's very big, and I hope you'll all read it. 
but uh, I am going to touch on a few key points, some findings and conclusions. I'm also going to offer some policy prescriptions that are much more my opinion uh, than necessarily shared by my co-authors. Um, ta talking to the Taliban um, has always been a part of the conversation, but it became a really big part of the conversation in 2000, late 2010 and in 2011 when I feel like talks became the new counterinsurgency, that new cure-all that was going to deliver Afghanistan from all of its problems. Um, but still, a couple years after it became the sort of topic of conversation in DC on how to deal with Afghanistan, still talks have been a failure to date. And every time we get a glimmer of good news, there's always, it's always qualified a couple days later by saying that it fell apart. For example, that the Taliban were going to open an office in Qatar and President Karzai objected to the sign they had outside of their headquarters um, and he canceled the security cooperation uh, negotiations over that issue. So what's interesting, uh, I think this is a consequence of talks becoming a policy by osmosis rather than deliberation. Um, the talk embracing, Washington embraced the talks process in London um, due to failures on the battlefield, uh, the shortcomings of the campaign, rather than as a thing, uh, the idea that talks were good on their own basis and talks would, would be something that could actually stabilize Afghanistan. And this, um, this lesson was reflected as well in the Soviet experience, which we deal with extensively in our report and we think has been referred to uh, not often enough in Washington because we view ourselves as so different from the Soviet Union, and, and we are, of course, in many ways, but that doesn't mean we don't have anything to learn from their campaign. Um, there's been a lot of wishful thinking with the way talks have been approached and confused thinking. What do we really want out of talks? Are we trying to divide the movement? Are we trying to isolate the hawks from the doves? Are we trying to kill Mullah Omar or talk to Mullah Omar? What are we exactly trying to accomplish? And I'd also like to emphasize the, the bad timing. Uh, the timing for talks could not have been worse over the last couple of years. We were not negotiating from a position of strength, but rather a position of weakness because we'd announced that we were withdrawing troops before we announced that talks were a matter of US policy. Uh, and we, doing so, we took away the biggest stick, the biggest leverage we had on the table as far as the Taliban were concerned, and that is our troop presence in Afghanistan. Um, and I'd also like to touch on the issue of poor management. Uh, within the US government, you had DOD, National Security Council, um, other parts of the White House, the Department of State, parts of the Department of State, all pursuing this policy or not pursuing this policy for different reasons. And we called this the anarchy of good intentions. But that wasn't just limited to Washington, that also extends to our allies in NATO and in Saudi Arabia, uh, all of whom have been trying to play a role in talks, but not in a coordinated, single-minded fashion towards the same goal. Um, a lot has been made of this supposed moderate awakening in the Taliban, that there are these pragmatic and moderate people that we can deal with in the Taliban leadership. Not to say that that isn't the case, but the real game changer again is the departure of US troops and NATO troops, not some sort of moderate awakening in the Taliban. And I think the ideas of moderate, moderation and pragmatism are confused and often referred to as the same thing. And in fact, that's a category mistake. There are two very different qualities that sometimes overlap, but pragmatism is not necessarily moderation. A willingness to talk does not mean that the Taliban have, mo have moderated over the years. Um, and last, I'd like to talk about the localism of the conflict. We've approached talking to the Taliban as if the Taliban was this strict, strictly controlled hierarchical movement that we can negotiate with some people at the top and the rest of the insurgency will just fall into line. Um, but reflecting on my own experience in Afghanistan, and I'm sure many people in the audience who have been in Afghanistan have observed the same thing, people are fighting for very local reasons and are often only casually connected to the leadership or the hierarchy of the Taliban. So even if we were to strike a deal with the Taliban leadership or the Kabul government was, there's certainly no guarantee that that would hold. And I think we only need to look back to the 90s at all the supposed negotiated uh, deals between different Mujahideen parties or the government and different, different commanders that fell apart within days or months uh, to know that deals in Afghanistan are not necessarily deals. Um, and so now I would just like to offer three policy suggestions for the US. And again, these are my own opinions and not necessarily my co-authors. I'm definitely the biggest pessimist on the writing team. Um, the first is to step back. Washington, this cannot be a Washington-led process. One, it won't work if it's a Washington-led process and it hasn't worked so far. And two, we are leaving. Our biggest stick is being taken off the table. We don't have the leverage that we had before. 
and we misused that leverage when we had it. This needs to be an Afghan-led process. Now, Afghan-led is a phrase that's been used often in this campaign. Uh, and what it's often meant in practice is you put an Afghan face in front of you, but you're writing the strategy and the policy. This has to be a, a program that is led by Kabul. Um, and I think the roadmap offered by the High Peace Council last November, even though it's faltered, uh, was a big step in the right direction. When the High Peace Council went to Islamabad and laid out a five-step plan towards a peace settlement. But this isn't to say that we shouldn't be involved. And in fact, the most important, aside from supporting the Afghan National Security Forces with our dwindling resources in country, the most important thing we can do is to ensure that there is a stable transition when Kar that, and that Karzai does actually step down when he's constitutionally mandated to next year and that there are free and fair elections held in Afghanistan next year and that there is a legitimate leader because Karzai himself is the biggest obstacle to talks. And I say this for a few reasons, but most practically, the Taliban will not negotiate with President Karzai. Uh, just like the Mujahideen leaders saw Najibullah in the late 80s and early 90s, he is not someone that they feel they can do, bus they can do business with. They see, him as a pup they see him as a puppet, they see him as powerless, they see him as fundamentally corrupt, and they are not willing, nor can they be seen by their grassroots to be doing business with President Karzai. It is therefore, for the, for the purpose of talks and other issues in Afghanistan, it is crucial that Karzai steps down as he, is, as he is supposed to. And my third policy recommendation is to clear the chefs out of the kitchen. Um, last time I checked, you had the US, Britain, Germany, Japan, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and probably more countries that I don't even know about, all trying to get directly involved in some sort of talks process. There are too many chefs in the kitchen. Uh, they're not working off the same recipe. This isn't to say that the international community doesn't have an important role to play. They absolutely do, but they need to be reading off the same recipe. They need to be coordinating and working together rather than working at cross purposes. Um, there's lots of other important issues. Pakistan is something that I'm sure we'll discuss in the Q&A, but for now I'll turn it over to my co-author, Peter Newman. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I should say uh, from the beginning that I'm not per se an expert on the Taliban or the Afghani or Afghanistan. What I have contributed to this report is my expertise on studying similar situations in the past where governments were negotiating with groups that they'd previously considered insurgents or terrorists. In fact, in 2007, I published an article in Foreign Affairs that sums up some of these experiences. And what I've done for this report is to see how these lessons compare and what perhaps can be learned from previous experiences for what is currently going on in Doha. And first of all, I should say that I'm not opposed in principle to negotiations with insurgents or terrorists. In fact, if you read my foreign affairs article, what you'd conclude likely is that if anything, I'm probably in favor of those negotiations in principle. What I'm not in favor, however, is talking for talking's sake. In fact, what I've always argued is that if you talk to terrorists or insurgents, there needs to be a reasonable chance for success. That is a negotiated agreement that leads to sustainable peace. And based on that premise, and based on my analysis, what I think is happening in Afghanistan right now, I'm very skeptical that those negotiations will lead to success. And more than that, I fear that the talks process itself will further destabilize an already fragile situation. Let me briefly tell you why I think that is the case. And there's three main reasons. Number one, the kind of negotiations that have just been started typically take a lot more time than America has left in Afghanistan. I can't think of any recent example where such a process would have been completed successfully in a year. Whether you look at Northern Ireland, Sri Lanka, the Middle East, or currently Colombia, the Basque Country, these negotiations go on for years, and they go on for years for reasons. Uh, once you sit down, there is a period in which you have to start to get to know each other, develop trust, there's a period in which you have confidence building measures, you have the actual negotiations, and even when the negotiations in principle are finished, each side takes time in order to be able to sell that deal to their constituency, and only then you get people to sign on the dotted line. And even if you have that kind of process, that doesn't account for setbacks, breakdowns, upsets. It also doesn't include the time it takes to implement 
the results of that negotiations process, which arguably should be seen as part of the process itself. So even if you have the perfect process that doesn't involve any breakdowns or upsets, it's hard to imagine how you can get this done in a year. It's never been done before. And so as far as timelines are concerned, based on previous experiences, I'd be astonished, I'd be very surprised if we had a sustainable agreement in the time frame that we have. But that's not my main objection. The main objection, the second reason why I'm skeptical, is that the process doesn't include all relevant parties. It's negotiations so far between the Taliban and the US. And they are both, of course, important and powerful players, but they are not the only ones. Take the Northern Ireland peace process. If that is the model, um, then one thing you have to recognize is that one of the keys to the success in Ireland was that everyone had to be on board. The Irish government, the British government, the Americans, the big political parties on both sides, Protestant and Catholic, and the violent actors of both sides, the IRA and the loyalists. Everyone was at the table, and it was hard. But when they signed the agreement, after nearly 10 years of informal and formal negotiations in 1998, they knew that everyone was on board. It still took a long time to get it implemented, but everyone who's been involved in those negotiations will tell you that it was key that everyone sign on to it. Just imagine, just imagine for a second that Secretary Kerry would stand up in front of the press today announcing that he was going to open unilateral negotiations about Middle East peace with Hamas. What do you think the reaction would be? Do you think that President Abbas, do you think that Prime Minister Netanyahu would just stand on the side and say, good luck, well done, we'll see what comes out? Of course they would. They would be strongly against it, they would condemn it, and they'd probably do whatever they can to sabotage these talks. That is exactly, of course, what I do expect to happen, what to some extent has already happened in the case of Afghanistan. Now, um, I understand everyone's disappointed with the Karzai government. He's given everyone lots of reasons to be disappointed. He hasn't delivered on a lot of promises he has made. But you can't just dismiss him and say that his government doesn't matter. The truth is that the assumption by everyone who thinks that these talks will work is that Karzai will somehow disappear, not play a role, just stand on the sidelines. Of course, he will not do that. He may not be very good at delivering for his own people, but he retains the capacity to sabotage these talks. And that's a crucial element that this talks process is missing out on. He understands perfectly well that these talks, at least as far as the Taliban in Pakistan are concerned, are partly intended to humiliate him, to show how insignificant, how irrelevant he is. And he knows that he wants to prevent that from happening. If you were Karzai, you would be doing exactly the same. The third reason I'm skeptical about these talks is something that Ryan already alluded to. We're pursuing these talks under the assumption that there is a movement called the Taliban that is unified, hierarchical, and that the people we're talking to can actually deliver their movement. We're kind of assuming that the Taliban are like the IRA under Jerry Adams. But everyone who studied this conflict knows that the Taliban are not the IRA. For six or seven years, as our report shows, we've been looking for people within the movement that are moderate, that want to strike a deal, and that can also deliver the movement, or at least most of the movement. Yet they all either turn out to be not particularly influential, not particularly moderate, or neither. And that's to a great extent because of the kind of movement the Taliban are. Decentralized, driven often by local grievances, divided into numerous factions. I doubt anyone can deliver the Taliban. So yes, I'm skeptical. I don't think there's enough time. I don't think we've done enough to include potential spoilers. And I don't think we have a negotiation partner who can necessarily deliver. Well, you may say, shouldn't we be trying anyway? What's the harm? Is it, isn't it better than doing nothing? And to that, my answer would be, I'm not sure. What we're seeing right now in Afghanistan is that those talks already have a destabilizing effect. There's all kinds of talk about a secret deal. People are arming in expectation of some kind of secret deal coming out. And furthermore, rather than promoting reconciliation as suggested by Ryan, these talks are offering the Taliban in Pakistan a shortcut and are precisely preventing the sort of process that we should be seeing. 
They used to say that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I have no doubt that those talks that are currently taking place are well intended, at least from the American side. But good intentions do not always lead to good outcomes, and that's why I'm skeptical that these talks will lead to success. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, glad to be here, and uh, I enjoyed very much the report. Um, I think that uh, it's refreshing to see a report and a study and analysis uh, that offers a narrative that is different from what we have been used to in Washington, at least in other capitals, over the last three, four years, calling for almost uh, unconditional, unrestricted wish and desire and hope to talk to the Taliban. Uh, for many Afghans, uh, this wishful thinking has, ha has a realistic side, but also has a very unrealistic dimension. Uh, Afghans have known the Taliban since the mid-1990s, 94, 95, when they first emerged. So there is a history. You have covered part of negotiations that, have, that were held in the 1980s with the Soviets, when the Soviets were trying to find a way out of Afghanistan. And the biggest, the biggest challenge facing that particular process was that there was no real Afghan voice. There was the Kabul regime, which really didn't really represent many people. And then you had Pakistan speaking on behalf of the rest of the Afghans. And so this is why the Geneva process of the 1980s uh, led to failure, basically. And uh, resulted in Afghanistan, um, you know, facing a series of, series of calamities uh, because there was a political vacuum that was created. And there was a political vacuum because no one allowed the Afghan people or representatives of the Afghan people and those who were, at the time, uh, reflecting the Afghan will to be present and express it. And so this is why later on, after 9-11, bon the Bonn Conference, the first Bonn Conference of 2001, tried to remedy that and tried to make sure that there were Afghan voices, credible Afghan voices, and that there was an international community to come together and to plan and design the next steps to create an Afghan government, an Afghan state, and so on and so forth. So there are lessons to be learned from the past, definitely. Uh, the Soviet experience being one. And then there are people who say, well, we should have brought the Taliban to the table back in Bonn. My answer as, as a person who was in Bonn at the time, and I, I covered Bonn for CNN and, and not covered by offered opinion and commentary to CNN, but I also had inside uh, uh, contacts and spent a lot of my time within the confines of the, the uh, conference, knew that there was no way whatsoever for those who think that the Taliban should have been brought at the table in Bonn in 2001, to bring the Taliban to the table. How do you bring a, who do you bring first to the table? Mullah Omar got onto a motorcycle and rode into the sunset, rode off into the sunset, and to this day we don't know where he is. To this day we don't even know if he's alive or not in, in reality. And he, he, he pronounces a few statements once or twice a year, we know it's not his statements. We know what his level of education is. Uh, it's prepared for him, and uh, he submits it to the media. So who do you talk, who, who were we supposed to talk to in 2001 in Bonn? Uh, the runaway Taliban who were fleeing with Al-Qaeda uh, to Pakistan, back to, the re to, to their sanctuaries? And what, what were we going to deal with with them? They were representing a regime that did not have the, 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 the uh, approval of the Afghan people. Uh, it was imposed on the Afghan people. It faced a rebellion. And it had brought in foreigners into the country and set up terrorist camps to, use, to be used to attack others. So, so, I mean, were they a credible interlocutor to be brought in bond? So my, my, there are lots of questions to those who, who think that that was the chance, that was the opportunity to solve the Afghan problem politically back in Bonn. But that wasn't. Realistically speaking, uh, that could never have happened. Other Afghans were not willing to sit down with Mullah Omar or his kind uh, at any table. And to this day, to this day, 12 years later, 
they have difficulties accepting even a Taliban flag flying, let alone sitting and negotiating with him. So if we are going to be realistic about talks and negotiations, we have to re be realistic as to, from an Afghan perspective again, as to who the Taliban represent. This is a big question. Who are they, first of all, in the Afghan sense? If you look at a nation, it's a state, and a country, and a people. Who, do they, who are the Taliban? Who do they represent? And wh where do they come from? And then the second question is, what kind of conflict is this? You know, you hear people who say this was a civil war. This, you know, after the Soviets left. When, when the Soviets were there, we all knew what kind of a conflict it was. All Afghans were together against the enemy. The international community joined the Afghans and fought the enemy. And we were successful. But then the Afghans were left alone. Left alone, but then our neighbors were still there. And our neighbors picked up the pieces. And Afghans were not given the opportunity to create their own political uh, 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 solution to the problem. So, so civil war, some people say, well, we, this is the continuation of an Afghan civil war. Well, if it is a civil war, we are talking about probably less than 1% fighting against 99%. What kind of a civil war is this? Because the, the Taliban, it's, it, I would like anyone to come and prove to me that they represent 30, 40, 50% of the country. They do not. To this day, we claim that there are no more than 30,000 active fighters on the ground. And to this day, every poll and every, every uh, survey done in Afghanistan shows that they have no more than 7% sympathy amongst the Afghan population. This can't be a civil war. Is it an ethnic war? You know, for years we, have learned, we, have, we are hearing from Islamabad that this is, these are the Pashtuns who are dissatisfied. That the Taliban are the representatives of the Pashtun majority who are dissatisfied. They don't even understand or they don't want us to understand that there is no majority minority in Afghanistan. This, they are the, larger, the largest group, but nobody represents more than 50% of Afghanistan. No ethnic group represents more than 50% of the population. So this is, you know, and to the Afghans, this is, there are, there are signs of ethnicity, of course, involved in this, because people gather around their ethnic group to defend themselves. But it has never been viewed as Pashtuns against others. Afghans have never looked at this as others against Pashtuns. And to this day, you have Pashtuns within the army. And the Mr. Karzai's government is 80% Pashtun today. So when, when you hear the, the, uh, the statements are coming out of Pakistan saying that this, there is a disenfranchised Pashtuns who have lost to the Northern Alliance made up of non-Pashtuns in Afghanistan, and you look at the composition of the government, and I'm saying this as a Pashtun myself, you look at the composition of the government, and you see that 80% of today's highest posts in the government are held by Pashtuns. So how could it be disenfranchisement of Pashtuns in Afghanistan? Or is it disenfranchisement of that one small group? And so who are these, this small group? What do they want? These are questions that have to be answered before we sit at the table. We have to understand who we are talking about. The people in Afghanistan today are asking Mr. Karzai's government, who is the friend, who is the foe? You have not been able to define to this day who amongst the Taliban we can trust and who we cannot trust. Who is a friend who is fighting us, who could be a friend, and who isn't? To this day, that hasn't been defined. So who are we going to talk to? Not knowing who we are facing. So this leads the Afghans to think that the Taliban are really not the issue. They are the, the proxy army that is fighting a larger strategic agenda for a larger purpose. And so if you look back at the history, and if you talk to any Afghan, Pashtun or non-Pashtun, they will point to the region and to our neighbors as being the main cause of the pro dilemma. They will point to the sanctuaries in Pakistan, to the support networks in Pakistan and beyond Pakistan, and I don't want to just finger Pakistan here and point Pakistan. It's, it's, a, it's a vast network. It's a vast network, unfortunately, whether you want it or not, that also ha has a belief system. A vast network that thinks that it's through radical Islam that they can impose their will. To them, it is a jihad. 
To the rest of the Afghans, it's not. So it's not civil war. It's not ethnic warfare. It's something different. And it's something bigger than that. And this is where the, where, where the West has failed to understand this problem. And this is where the United States is looking. So, so political expediency comes into play. For the West, well, let's get out of here as soon as we can. But then what? Didn't this happen back in the 1990s? When everybody left after the Soviets were defeated? And who filled the vacuum? Are we going to... now? Those elements are still there. Not only are they still there, they are more powerful today than they were back in the 1990s. There is now something called the TTP added to it, with all, all its branches and all its arms. And so you're going to leave this region in the hands of whom? And so, so these are the questions that have to be answered before we enter talks, and before we define the parameters for talks. And before we, we design who, we de designate who should be our interlocutor. And I think that these are exactly the things that are being discussed today in Afghanistan. The Afghans are extremely worried and concerned. They're not worried about the fact that NATO is leaving. They're worried about the fact that the problem hasn't been resolved. They don't want NATO forces, US forces on their land forever. They don't want you to lose your sons and daughters. They don't want all your billions of dollars at the end of the day that would amount to nothing. This huge investment that will amount to nothing if the vacuum is filled again by these forces. So this is why the political process in Afghanistan, as was alluded to, is so, so important. It's not just fighting the Taliban. It's not just seeking peace. It's also to make sure that there is an Afghan front, a legitimate Afghan side that can also that can talk to the other side so that the other side understands that the afghan side elected by the people of afghanistan to the extent possible as legitimately and credibly as possible has the strength and the and a strategy and a plan to enter into talks otherwise i think that we are wasting everybody's time and we are entering a very dangerous seen post-2014. I will stop here and hopefully have discussions. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to some good questions. I would ask uh, that you accept some ground rules before we begin the Q&A portion of the, of the talk here. So the whole objective of us gathering here today is to obtain information and, query, and to query the people who did the research. So I, I, I am not one of those experts. I'm also here to learn, and I hope that you are as well. The best question is probably delivered in one sentence. I know that that can be a little, a little difficult for some. Uh, I would ask that you keep it at most to two to three sentences if you need a little bit of setup. Please, please be respectful of the, of the folks that came here to give this presentation today, but we do look forward to hearing your thoughts. And also, please feel free to challenge our speakers as well. So with that, we have questions. And I'm remiss in not saying hello to David. I'll go in the front row here. Mm -hmm. Sir. <laughs> Morning. Um, it's not morning. <laughs> My name is Ogad Malik. Um, I'm an assistant professor at National Defense University, Islamabad. Um, currently senior fellow at SAIS, Johns Hopkins. And I'm Alizé Durani, originally from Helmand. So, nice mixture. Born and brought up in England. And formerly War Studies oh, at King's. Great. So, we're all here. I think my sentences are gone. Uh, <laughs> So this umbrella organization, nebulic cloud of opposition against the United States, NATO, ISAF, Afghan government. Nothing's been able to dislodge it for the last 12 years, really. The West is going, predominantly. Money will most likely dry up. Why should they negotiate? There's no need. They fought it out for so long, they resisted. Whoever this may be, as you've made it out, why? There's no need at all. They may as well just continue. And that means it's going to fall into something else altogether. Um, you're right. I mean, that is the fear. Uh, 
that they don't have an incentive to negotiate. Uh, and that, this, that what we are hearing uh, are just tactical moves to buy time uh, until 2014 strikes, NATO leaves, and then uh, whatever happens, happens. Now, th there are risks also with that calculation. Because on one hand, Afghans have come to a point where they, they realize that they need to defend the gains of the last 12 years. They feel that their security forces may have reached a certain level of competence and organization that would help them defend their gains and their territory. And that eventually there are other considerations that could help resolve this issue. Part of it has to do with India-Pakistan. But they are not totally sure. Nobody is sure. Nobody knows what might happen. And the Taliban don't really, you know, I, we don't, I don't particularly see any political will within what we call the Taliban leadership to enter to, to, into talks, genuinely. So the other options that they have are either to enter into the power structure, power sharing arrangement, which is something that we keep hearing about. But how does that happen? You know, power sharing with the Taliban is not an easy proposition when you have to defend the constitution and women and children and education and healthcare and so on and so forth and free media and election, elections and a democracy. And they're against all of these things. The other theory put forth is you give them some territory, which is something that is nowadays has created a huge backlash in Afghanistan saying, what, are you trying to tell us that as an incentive we have to give them the Pashtun territories of Afghanistan? And then what? Well, what will that create? Will it not create a Talibistan? And how do you then deal with a Talibistan? So these are issues that are currently very much on the minds of at least the Afghan political class and being discussed as we move towards elections. And the best case scenario is to say, OK, we come to a, an agreement with the Taliban whereby they enter the political fold. And they come under the, ca in, in the, you know, they come in under the tent and they run for office. And we've been saying this to them all along. If you're, Afghan, if you're an Afghan citizen and if you, you know, meet all the criteria, Mullah Omar can come and run and become a candidate. And if he, if he wins the votes, good for him. But they don't want to do that either. They have show, shown no inclination whatsoever to submit themselves to the ballot. Yeah, just um, three points. Um, I can't see into the minds of Mullah Omar and the Qadashura and the Taliban commanders, but uh, I am fairly confident that they view negotiation as a continuation of warfare rather than something apart from warfare, which is how we tend to view negotiation, as something that's happening on the side um, that can solve the conflict, whereas they view it as a part of their entire political and military campaign. Um, the second issue, and I'm really glad you brought up why people fight, and this is something I alluded to in my remarks, but just to go into a little more detail, in Helmand, uh, Generally, people we'd call the Taliban or insurgents are fighting due to land tenure conflicts and land usage conflicts that might not have anything to do with the government. They might. And, and this isn't just why people fight. This is why people in the, in the South are participating in politics, in the government and in the rebellion. Um, the current situation is also very good for the opium trade. It's very profitable. So there are criminal groups that have incentives to keep the conflict going. And there's competition over the opium trade. And then there's rebellion against what is seen as a predatory government that seizes their land, steals things, abuses them, taxes them illegally. So how does a power sharing agreement solve any of these problems? How does constitutional reform, reform of a piece of paper that nine out of 10 people in Helmand, where in Helmand are you from, by the way? I was, I was born about okay. Helmand. Okay. I haven't been to that part of it. But I mean, what does this mean to people in Helmand, constitutional reform? I would argue not very much. Um, elections you know, going into entering the political fold. Najibullah instituted something called national reconciliation, 
the prodding of the Soviets. We even managed to use the same word as the Soviets, reconciliation. And this went to such lengths beyond what we were even willing to do. He would let anyone register a political party and compete in elections. He devolved power in the South and the East and all across the country down to the lowest level. We call them informal village councils now. They, um, the name's probably changed six times, at least the acronym has, I'm sure, since I've been there. But um, Najibullah went above and beyond in terms of political form than what we're even talking about. And none of it worked because the Mujahideen understand they didn't need to negotiate. And that's all I would say. I, you know, I, I, I'm not as pessimistic generally about uh, power sharing arrangements. I also do not think that necessarily it is, uh, you know, the end of the story if both sides have issues or positions that they don't agree on or where they are fundamentally opposed to each other. I think in every conflict, in every peace process um, that I've looked at, that's how it started out. And at the beginning of the process, you looked at the position, you said, ooh, that will never work. It's like 180 degrees apart. And therefore, you have to ask yourself, why do these people engage in negotiations in the first place? They do engage in negotiations because they think that the outcome of the negotiations is still better than what they are likely to expect if they continue with the status quo. And that is precisely the reason why the Taliban process is unlikely to succeed, because ultimately there is no incentive for them to compromise their positions. I don't think that it's impossible for them or for any insurgent or terrorist movement to compromise their positions. It always happens. But there has to be an incentive for them to want to do that. Right now, as Ryan said, the one leverage that the West had, namely the continued presence there, is going to be gone. They can just sit tight and wait it out. There is no real reason why they should give way in those negotiations. And that's why I think they are constructed the wrong way. The key element that allows for compromise and negotiations when you have those negotiations is missing from that process. I'm going to ask a follow-up question to Peter. Is, is there any history of a reconciliation process uh, at the local a reintegration process at the local level working in parallel with the reconciliation process at the top level? Has that ever worked before that mm. you're aware of? I, I'm not aware of one, but I guess that if there's some sort of process in Colombia right now, I think that's what they would be trying to do. Whether it's going to succeed, I don't know. But I, I think that's clearly the intention, even though the sort of um, bottom-up process started before the top-down process. But I think the intention is to have it both operating in parallel. Um, I'll, please, I'll come back to you. Uh, James Kitfield from National Journal Magazine. Could, could you talk first, um, two points. Compare, if you would, these negotiations to, for instance, Dayton or, um, you know, the, the Arab awakening in Iraq uh, and give us why these are different and much less hopeful, uh, seems to be your panel's uh, basic conclusion. And also, um, if, you know, it gets to the question of aren't they better than at least are, trying. We're not going to stay there, as the ambassador seems to imply would be the better thing to do. Um, but we're not staying there. And we still are going to, I imagine, retain some influence with money, with special forces, with, I mean, I, I imagine that there are, there is influence we can bring to bear even after the combat troops leave at the end of 2014. Why is that not uh, enough to at least try to pursue talks and use that as leverage? Did you have that aimed at anybody in particular up here? Was that at Peter? Uh, I think Peter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I mean, two things that would come to mind here in <coughs> response to the comparison to the to the awakening movement in Iraq. I don't see that happening in Afghanistan right now. I don't. Th I don't see how there is a bottom-up, wide-scale bottom-up movement that would demand. Um, that kind of situation to come about. So I think that would be the obvious difference to Iraq. In the case of Bosnia, I think one often forgets in the case of the Dayton Agreement, we always look at the Dayton Agreement as if somehow, suddenly, people turned up and there was an agreement. Of course, that was not the case. There were years of fruitless negotiations that went before 
I don't know if you remember the Vance plan and the Owen plan, and it was very, very frustrating. It went on for years, and that goes back to my point about timescales. I, I think to get to the point of Dayton, there's a couple of three, four, or five years left at least. And the second point is, of course, related to what I said before. In the case, Dayton succeeded because America decided to intervene and put a lot of pressure on the parties to come to an agreement. So there was an incentive for the fighting factions to come to some sort of compromise and to some sort of power sharing agreement. That sort of um, incentive is missing from this process. I think that's the key, that's the key difference. Peace and, nego uh, peace and compromise in Bosnia happened when America intervened. And here in Afghanistan, we have exact the, op the exact opposite. America is withdrawing, the, so the pressure is off. Um, just to address, uh, I'm not advocating, and none of the authors of the report are advocating that we shouldn't be facilitating or engaging in some sort of talks process. Uh, I'm also not saying we won't have any influence left in Afghanistan after 2014. We definitely will, and that, that will be some leverage, but it won't be nearly on the same scale. As far as the uh, comparisons to the Arab awakening, um, the sons of Iraq in Iraq, in, uh, in Iraq. Um, that comparison is one that was often made, particularly by ISAF spokesman, General Petraeus, General McChrystal. And they were, of course, taking their Iraq experience over to Afghanistan. But it had a few fundamental problems. One is uh, Afghan society is far more fragmented than Iraqi society was at the time, by 30 years of war. And the second, and a related point, is tribes in, in Afghanistan are just simply not structured the way tribes in Iraq uh, have been. Uh, where we could go to a Sunni tribal leader, a tribal sheikh in Iraq and strike an agreement with him that he could, uh, and that he could reasonably deliver on with the people in his tribe, in his area, uh, because the tribes there are more hierarchical. Whereas in Afghanistan, in the Pashtun South in particular, and, and certainly in the East, um, that's just not how tribes work. Tribes culturally exist more to preserve the autonomy of the, of the family and the individual. Um, and even to the extent that they were cohesive political elements, in my opinion at least, that has been completely undermined and fragmented by years and years of conflict. And so we've tried to replicate the success of the Sons of Iraq program through the village stability operations and the Afghan local police. And we've seeded these little militias all across the country. And these are, these are elements in further out into the rural areas that have chosen not to join the police, but they're joining these little local militias. And what I worry about is the pre-existing conflicts and tensions in Afghan society that are propelling people to fight to begin with. Land conflicts, um, you know, rival Mujahideen affiliations and rivalries going back 30 years. Um, by arming people that have chosen up until recently not to integrate with the government, giving them weapons and training and saying, great, well, it's time for us to leave. Uh, by the way, you're technically a part of the Afghan na National Police now. I'm sure that'll work out well. I, just, I think that'll make it a lot worse, actually. And I've called them mini civil war factories and something else that I've written. I just don't see how it helps the situation. And, but there definitely was a direct intellectual line between the Sons of Iraq program, the Arab Awakening, and this program. But I think it was one that completely misread both scenarios, in my opinion. I just want to add uh, to, to the point made here um, that there is no question that the international community is leaving the mission is ending as we have known it. It's most probably going to take on a different form, much more diminished and smaller, but more focused. So that is good news because that has to be uh, anchored. That has to be an anchor for the future, that the Afghan people need to realize that the international community is still committed, but in a different manner, uh, that they're not going to be abandoned. Uh, that the Taliban and those who support the Taliban understand that, okay, this is not the end of the day and this is not going to change much, even though their calculations might change. Uh, and that the political process in Afghanistan, as I said, is, which is probably the most critical of all, advances, but advances in such a manner where the Afghan people are able to select a new leadership team and the new leadership team will have enough power base and enough popular support to be able to then put the country back on a more healthy, hel healthier path, not only for its own sake, but also for the sake of international cooperation and the, and the sake of regional relationships. And it's at that point that there is an opportunity for engaging at a certain point with the other side. 
Uh, but the other side may, may want to continue fighting and disrupting the process. But at least what you have is a much more, is, is a stronger, more cohesive Afghan government side, uh, which could be a, a better partner to the international community and could uh, strategically uh, aim at moving towards a political dialogue. On the Ambar piece, I'd recommend an article that was written, I think, in 2008 or 9 by Carter Malkasian. Uh, and I think his co-author was Jerry Meyerly. Carter's now an advisor for General Dunford in, Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan. His article was on the differences between Iraq and Afghanistan. I think the title was something like, Why Iraq is Not Afghanistan. That's probably more relevant now today than it was in any year past. Uh, I'll go to the back, and then I'll come back up front. Sir. Sure. Thank you. My name is Nikolai. I'm from the Danish Embassy. Um, I would like to hear. Hold, hold the, it up to your. Uh, uh, I would li like to hear from the panel your, your deliberation fr on uh, the Soviet drawdown and leaving uh, Afghanistan and the present one. Uh, it seems like there's both similarities and differences, and I would like to hear where we are better off today and where we are doing the same mistakes. It seems like when the Soviet Union left. You had millions of refugee, uh, refugees in Pakistan and internally in Afghanistan. You had water systems broken down. You had villages totally destroyed. T you don't have that today, of my knowledge. On the other hand, you saw Najibullah being able to stay in power, even though until the Soviet Union collapsed and the funding dried, dried out. A same, similar thing that could happen when we leave Afghanistan post-14. So I would like to hear where are the why are we better off today and why are we doing the same mistakes? Thank you. Ryan has written that part. Yeah, um, I'll just comment briefly. We have this, we have a very uh, long and in my opinion well-written section on the report <laughs> on that. Um, there are some really, some key differences. And you're from the Danish embassy, did you say? I worked with Danish troops, so had a great time. Um, best food in Helmand. So, um, the biggest differences are, of course, is that the Soviet campaign was much more brutal. Um, the estimates are not as authoritative as, uh, as, or as accurate necessarily as, as I'd like them to be, but it's, the estimates go up to around 9% of Afghanistan's population, or 1 million people was killed in the 1980s. Um, but it's also important to remember that many of them were killed by other Afghans. Um, there were plenty of deaths in the tens of thousands, if not more. I wrote about this in an article before the Soviets even intervened militarily. Um, but the campaign was more brutal. The Soviets never controlled key parts of the countryside to the same extent that we've been able to. Uh, we've also sent uh, more troops um, and invested more resources. We're operating with a much bigger coalition. Um, but there's a lot of similarities. Uh, they only turned to talks once their efforts on the battlefield were not bearing the fruit that they expected. Um, their partners in talks were mainly the United States and Pakistan. Uh, they didn't try to negotiate, I mean, at least as a matter of national policy, directly with the Mujahideen uh, parties until they were already on their way out. But that's another key similarity between the campaigns. Barack Obama, President Obama has gotten a lot of um, criticism, I think justifiably, for announcing the end of the surge. Uh, you know, it's, it was a tough call to make. Uh, on one hand, you don't want to signal to the Afghanistan that this is an infinite commitment and they can take their time getting up on their feet in terms of the Afghan national security forces. But on the other hand, you don't want to signal to the enem your enemies when you're withdrawing so they could just know that you're withdrawing and hold off until then. Um, I do think he, the president made the wrong decision. And Gorbachev made a similar decision when before the Geneva Accords were even signed, he announced that there would be a front-loaded Soviet withdrawal if an agreement was reached. And this drove the negotiations team in Geneva crazy um, and they went on record saying that they thought it was a terrible decision, but once he gave that away, uh, he had nothing else to give away. He was announced that he would withdraw all of his troops. Now, we don't plan to withdraw all of our troops. There will be a residual force, I imagine, of at least 10,000, if not more, um, probably even up to 20,000, depending on the commitments that we can expect from our NATO partners. Um, so these are different situations. Refugees have returned to Afghanistan uh, in net rather than fled in the millions like they did during the Soviet War. But just because the Soviets were brutal uh, doesn't mean there isn't much to learn from their experience. And I think there's actually a great deal. And I'll recommend two, two books um, 
that came out within the last couple of years on that. One is by Kalinovsky. Uh, it's called The Long Goodbye, The Russian Withdrawal from Afghanistan. And the other is called Afghansi um, by a former British diplomat whose name eludes me at the moment. Um, both very valuable books, I think, for policymakers, scholars, anyone else to read that really wants to understand the Soviet withdrawal in more depth. And also the Wilson Center has posted all of the Politburo records from this period on their website in English translation. If I may just, uh, sure. an Afghan perspective on the two interventions. I mean, the Soviet intervention is very different from the international U.S.-led intervention of 2001. That was seen as a brutal occupation of a sovereign nation, which was denounced by the international community, the UN, and everybody. This is a United Nations-sponsored uh, and mandated mission, has been renewed every year by the United Nations. So, from legal, from the legality, legal point of view, you know, it's very different. Then, how it impacted Afghanistan? I mean, you cannot compare what the Soviet occupation meant to the Afghan people and to, to the infrastructure and to institutions. All the problems that we have inherited today are as a result of 10 years of communist and Soviet occupation and domination, unfortunately. Uh, a third of the population left. Over the last 12 years, we have seen a return of at least 4 million back to the country. Uh, rebuilding and reconstruction over the last 12 years is, is, is mind-boggling. Afghanistan has never seen this level of reconstruction in its history. So it's not that all the money has gone to waste or all the efforts have gone to waste. There is a good story to tell about everything. What has happened to women and girls and schools and health and, you know, and technology and media, it's all positive. So this is why it's so uh, important to make sure that we do not start going, you know, going backwards and in reverse again, and that we can maintain the momentum that has been built. It's just a question of putting the country back on the right track. And that's what the Afghan people want. Back during the Soviet occupation, you had 90% of the population against the, the, the occupation and fighting the occupation. Over the last 12 years, you've had 90% of the population with goodwill towards this particular intervention. Maybe afraid in some areas more than others because of the way operations have been carried out. But you still have overwhelming Afghan goodwill towards what the international community has done. I mean, that's a reality that cannot be ignored. David. Thank you very much. I'm David Oko, associate professor at the National Defense University. Uh, I have two, two very quick and related questions. Uh, first of all, this one is more specifically to Peter. Um, it seems to me that the lack of cohesion within the Taliban is a major obstacle in the way of talks. I just wanted to ask you, on the basis of your historical knowledge of negotiations, how much of an anomaly that is, and uh, are there any useful precedents from history from which we could learn? And the related question, which goes through the whole panel, is um, would it be possible, given how little we know about the enemy, to see the talks much more modestly as just an exercise of familiarization, to see whether there's any scope on which we can talk, uh, or which we can perhaps found future negotiations, rather than seeing them as a panacea, which we could then rightly, and as you have very well done, critiqued. Thank you. Uh, to answer your first question, I cannot think of any movement in recent history that would have been described as equally, um, you know, equally diverse and equally ununified. If we talk about, you know, groups like, I mean, it's wrong to assume that all these groups that negotiations have taken place with in the past were completely unified. And of course, it was a major concern and a driving factor in a lot of peace processes, or it's always a driving factor in a lot of peace processes for the insurgent and terrorist groups that engage in them, for them to be able to maintain cohesion within their movement. That is the single most important thing that drives terrorist or insurgent leaders, because they know they're going to compromise on things that people have died for and that people very, very strongly believe in they have to be able to sell it to their constituency in a way that prevents splinters from emerging. And that was the driving force behind uh, Jerry Adams' negotiating posture. That's why it took so long. But a lot of, including people like Tony Blair, have said they completely understood that. And they were able to, to tolerate that because 
for them, the most important thing was that Jerry Adams could actually deliver the IRA rather than splinter organizations popping up all over the place. And when we talk, for example, about Hamas in the Middle East, a lot of the writing about Hamas, for example, has been about different power centers. Is the power center with uh, the Damascus now Cairo faction, or is it within the Gaza Strip? And there has been a lot of talk about Hamas being uh, not a unified organization, but I can tell you Hamas is 10,000 times more unified than the Taliban. So if we're, talk, if, we're, if we're concerned about the lack of unity within Hamas, we should be 10,000 times more concerned about the lack of unity within the Taliban because it's a much more splintered and disunited movement than any, any other group that has recently engaged in negotiations. So the second part of the question. I don't have any um, <laughs> comments on that. You're refusing to answer David's question. David yeah, and I will talk <laughs> over <laughs> beers later. <laughs> I, ju I just want to add one thing. Uh, I think that the Taliban have cohesion at the top. And that has been maintained on purpose. And anyone over the years who has shown to disregard for this sense of cohesion or has tried to undermine it, has been eliminated or sidelined or disappeared or whatever. So whatever lack of cohesion exists among the Taliban is in the lower ranks. And of course you have the Haqqani dimension and you have the ta Pakistani Taliban dimension and you have the Al-Qaeda dimension and you have all these other jihadi types, the Central Asians. At the end of the day, they all have their connect connectivity. It's not like they're all separate from each other with no, you know, with no uh, common uh, worldview. Unfortunately, they do have a common worldview. Uh, but at the same time, when it comes to the Afghan Taliban, the leadership, which is thought to be the Kuwaita leadership, uh, has been able to direct and, op and, and, and control to the extent that they can. And whenever there has been dissension, it has been cracked down on. I would disagree that there have been no recent uh, insurgencies that are more fragmented. I think the Iraq uh, uh, case, you could go as far as not even to describe it as an insurgency. Um, there were at one point 100 different groups that claimed to be operating inside of Iraq. So imagine, imagine Ryan's you know, statement earlier about the, the low-level Taliban fighting for a variety of local reasons, whether it's drugs or uh, uh, land disputes or tribal issues or some combination thereof, in, and had named, all, had, uh, each one of these little groups took a name. Each one of these groups decided to become the whatever front or the whatever coalition. Um, and they all had independent uh, objectives, independent leaders, independent operations. They were all loosely interconnected, interwoven with each other. They shifted allegiances freely in many cases. Um, I, I, again, I'm not saying to draw a direct linkage there, but I think that, that there are opportunities to study fragmented insurgencies that are quite, maybe quite relevant. Um, anybody on this side of the room? We've been going over this side quite heavily, sure. Thank you. Um, so um, I think, you know, the big dimension um, that you didn't talk about is really the, and that's really looking into the broader context and the reason that things are not getting resolved. Given that, you know, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you said, you know, that probably no more than 30,000 of the insurgents, yeah. Um, so there's obviously, you know, a steady stream that's basically, you know, kept at that level. You know, I mean, we're always reading about casualties, you know, happening on the insurgent side. So um, I think there's a bigger and other dimension to this, and you didn't talk about that. You talked a little bit about, you know, the land part of it, you know, but those are really local disputes, and I think those are easily addressed. You know, the local grievances probably will be resolved because it would not take a lot of funding or money. The bigger context in, is, in this also goes to what happened to Najibullah, confirmed or unconfirmed reports basically that um, he was shot specifically because um, he was asked to sign in an agreement or basically an acknowledgement recognizing the current border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I think if the Duran line, if that's not looked into and addressed and resolved, um, 
the issues are not going to go away, and that's probably what it is. And Afghanistan is not really kind of in, in a position to compete population-wise, economically, and um, um, educationally just cannot compete with a much larger, you know, overpopulated country like Pakistan. So you didn't talk about that part of it. And um, so the question is, you know, if that issue is addressed, you know, really to a pretty much somehow resolve that, would that really stop the flow of insurgents into Afghanistan and probably, you know, allow for stability? It, it, is a, it is a critical issue. It is one that makes Afghans very nervous. They see it as a historic issue, dating back to British colonial times and the arbitrary drawing of a line in the middle of Pashtun territory, dividing villages and families and clans. And the history also shows that various Afghan governments over the years have tolerated it to the point where it sort of became mute at some juncture, a mute issue. And at times they've used it politically against their neighbor. There is a, also nowadays a, a, a yearning to put this behind us and to find some type of formula to resolve it. And I think that I, I did a, I did a uh, survey last year uh, through USIP of Afghan political elites and I brought up this issue and, and majority of the political elites in the country said that they would rather have a referendum on it which shows their willingness to tackle this issue through a democratic means and uh, resolve this historic matter. Now, will this solve our issue with Pakistan and whatever Pakistan is trying, attempting to do in Afghanistan, I don't know. I don't know if the correlation is that strong. I'm not sure, that is an issue, one issue, but if let's suppose tomorrow the Durand line issue is resolved, will that be enough and sufficient to make the generals in in uh, Raul Pindi change their attitude towards Afghanistan, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. Um, I'm very happy someone brought up the Pakistan issue. Uh, it's obviously very important. Pakistan has three long-standing interests vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. One is blunting Pashtun nationalism, which isn't a major issue now, but it was a few decades ago when before the Soviet-Afghan war, there was actually a series of border clashes between Afghan forces and militias and Pakistani forces. The second is maintaining strategic depth against India. In the event of an attack by India, they would have a place to fall back on, essentially, and also avoiding strategic encirclement by India, which is why Islamabad views with um, no small amount of fear and skepticism increasing cooperation between the Afghan National Security Forces and the Indian, Indian intelligence services and Indian military. Um, Pakistan will pursue these interests whether we want them to or not. And uh, it's been interesting to watch American policy evolve towards Pakistan, uh, massive military aid, massive civilian aid, in the hopes that if we shower money on Pakistan, we'll change the way that we view, they view the world, and that's just simply not the case. Um, and we increasingly hear this desire to stick it to Pakistan, because in pursuit of these interests, they've obviously been supporting these violent non-state groups, uh, all the way from the Mujahideen groups of the 80s and 90s, all the way up into the pal uh, Pak the, I'm sorry, the Taliban and uh, the Haqqani network now. And there's the desire that, well, when we withdraw, we can finally stick it to Pakistan, because we really hate these guys. That's what some people say. And I have a lot of personal resentment towards Pakistan, having seen um, the fruits of their policies in Afghanistan a lot. But I think we need to be careful for a couple reasons. One is, we still have to get out of Afghanistan. We have a lot of rolling stock and equipment that will need to be driven out through Pakistan. That's just a, a more practical matter. The second is, does sticking it to Pakistan really change the situation or make it better? And I would argue it doesn't. Um, by encourage, do we want to encourage India to get closer to the Afghan uh, government, the Afghan National Security Forces? I'm not sure we do. I'm not, I'm not saying we, would, we should try to keep them apart, but by, uh, let's say, encouraging them to make arms sales or 
take up the slack in terms of uh, training their security forces as we leave, that validates the Pakistani narrative and really only encourages, incentivizes the worst sort of behavior and the most dangerous behavior that we see from Pakistan. And from a U.S. perspective, and you know, that's, that's the perspective that I'm speaking from, regional stability should be our biggest concern in that part of the world. And in that sense, keeping Pakistan stable should be as, as terrible of an ally or frenemy or partner or whatever we're calling them this week, as terrible as they are, um, Pakistani stability should be very important to us. Sure. Yeah. My name is Alexander Orleans. I'm a uh, student at Georgetown University. Uh, my question is that the subject of the IRA often comes up when discussing talks with the Taliban because of the similar specters that they raise in the public consciousness internationally, but obviously there are very different places in terms of leadership, cohesion, fatigue with violence, and inclination towards politics. My question is, given the future that's expected, a very selfish U.S. presence, posture of special forces and training forces, Will that happen for the Taliban? Will there be a fatigue? Will there be an inclination towards politics? And if so, what will it look like? Or is it just a pipe dream and this is all tactical? Thank you. Uh, I was going to take that for a grenade. No. I, I, I think I, I, I've tried to convey this personal view that uh, it's very difficult to, to think of the Taliban in IRA terms, <laughs> first of all, uh, and those who compare them, uh, compare the situation to the Irish situation, I think, are misleading themselves and us. Uh, but um, there is an, you know, I, I don't want to sound like uh, as though all the Taliban are fanatics and all are extremists who just want to continue fighting till they end up in heaven which is probably what most of them think and, and desi desire, actually. But there is an element within the Taliban that has, over the years, developed a second thoughts about their role and what they want and how to best achieve their political objective. And this is, but, but, but the question is, to what extent is this group in charge? And to what extent uh, are they the ones calling the shots? And this is where most Afghans believe that if, if they do exist, and, and most probably some do believe that there is a political solution to the issue, that they, they are not strong enough within the Taliban, and that then th this, this has become a tactic. It's, it's become part of a tactic to continue the warfare on one hand and talk about talks on the other hand. It's just talking about talks. Um, but whether over time this particular grouping can have more influence is something that one has to look into. And how can we help anyone, help them expand this influence and, and be more recognized as well as more in charge is something that we have to look at over time. I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, unless there's a coup within the Taliban, which is unlikely, or with, unless there is a change of heart again within the circles that direct the Taliban strategy. You know, I, you know, I'm glad you asked about the IRA. I, I lived in Belfast. I studied in Belfast. I wrote my PhD thesis about British government strategy in the Northern Ireland conflict. And Ryan told me to tone it down because it doesn't really matter to an American audience. So I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> I, I can unload now. Oh, excellent. Um, so I really, I really think the process is very, very different. And the IRA, when it started becoming interested in talks, was also in a different place. And even though it's become a bit of a cliche, but really, in order for talks to have some sort of chance of success, you have to have what William Zartman called a mutually hurting stalemate. So you have to have a situation which all the main parties perceive that if they just carry on, their situation will worsen. And right now, that's not the case in Afghanistan, because the Taliban can just wait it out. Um, that was the case for the IRA in the late <coughs> 1980s. They thought they were losing support. They thought that the campaign was not, the violent campaign was not achieving any objectives. It wasn't getting them anywhere. And of course, the British were tired of the expense and 
of carrying on as it was. So there was a perfect sort of situation to sit down at the table and talk about it. And you do not have that situation in Afghanistan. And the second difference, key difference, is what I alluded to in my talk, which is that based on that perception of mutually hurting stalemate, that then they then constructed an all-inclusive process that brought everyone to the table and that was carried out with an incredible amount of patience. If you actually read the biographies, autobiographies of um, past British prime ministers like John Major or Tony Blair, in America you may think that what they were most preoccupied with is the war in Iraq, the war on terror, international issues, but what both John Major and Tony Blair have written about in their autobiographies is that the single issue that has taken up most of their time throughout their time in office was the Northern Ireland conflict. Incredibly time consuming, requiring huge commitment from the British government and from all the other parties involved. And the idea that you can just pull this off in a year and then everyone is happy and Afghanistan will be peaceful I mean, if you talk to these people, they would tell you it's impossible. So it really differs from Northern Ireland in more than one respect. And always this talk, well, we talk to the IRA, let's talk to the Taliban. It just, does, it just doesn't work because the movements are different and the process was different. I don't think there's an empirical study of Taliban leadership. I think that would probably be very difficult to obtain. Um, we did interview a handful of Taliban, active Taliban leaders and former Taliban leaders as part of our research for the Afghan Peace and Reintegration Program. Uh, the, the, there seems to be at least a generational division based on that limited mm. anecdotal evidence and that the former Mujahideen Taliban are much more amenable to negotiations than the junior counterparts. Again, this is anecdotal, not, not empirical. So uh, there's certainly probably an, an age factor there where they're just, they may just be tired of fighting. Um, they may disagree with their younger counterparts who are more aggressive and apt to want to continue violence. There may be a whole host of behavioral and, and uh, reasons there that, that we, we can't fathom. Um, but it would be interesting to identify factions within the Taliban, perhaps, and determine whether or not factions within the Taliban wanted to split off and join a political coalition. This would be an interesting tactic uh, on the part of either the government of Afghanistan or the NATO coalition. I don't know if that's being attempted or not. Um, it might be more fruitful than this kind of holistic overarching approach to negotiate with the Taliban, which we generally agree doesn't necessarily exist as the Taliban. Uh, so th th I think you've raised a, a very important question. Do we have any other very important questions in the few minutes we have left? Again, keeping the question short. So right next to him. Yeah. You. No. You. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Jared Metzger. I'm a reporter with Interpress and also a student at SAIS. Um, I have a couple quick questions for Ambassador Samad. Um, you made uh, some interesting statements uh, when you said that, uh, one, that uh, the Taliban is part of a vast network, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on how vast that no network is. And you said that you couldn't only point to Pakistan, so I'm wondering if there are any other states particularly you could point to, or just other power, um, power brokers behind them. I was hoping that you would miss that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't. Uh, also, that, um, that there would be problems um, involved with giving the Taliban their own territory to control separate from um, Afghanistan. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what those problems, what you would see those problems being. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I mean, uh, on the regional level, uh, we Afghans sometimes say, we, you know, we are the victim of our geography, really. We, we are not situated very well in the world, and we live in the most dangerous, probably, uh, neighborhood you know on on earth uh, and we have gone through uh, two generations of warfare I and mean, uh, it started out when i was 17 and i'm 52 now so it's been a long time um, and so uh, for us uh, we we think that uh, we've had a major uh, issue with pakistan unfortunately uh, as much as and I, I know for a fact that the afghan government over the last 12 years because i was involved in much of a lot of the discussions with the pakistanis uh, we've we've tried our best to convey uh, a different model 
for relations with Pakistan. And it seems that we have failed. Uh, we have not been able to make any inroads and make any, you know, try, we have failed in trying to convince Pakistan to adopt a different posture. Um, with Iran, our other important neighbor, we have issues as well. Probably not as severe, but could become severe, with the potential to also be very problematic. Uh, and the reasons are obvious. Number one is the Western presence in Afghanistan. Uh, number two, we have uh, over a million refugees who are sort of held hostage. Every time we, relations are cool, refugees are being pressured in Iran. Um, and uh, there's a desire on the part of the Iran and the Iranians are flirting with the Taliban nowadays, which is very odd. Uh, so we don't know what to make of this. Afghans do not exactly know where this may lead, the flirtation between Iran and the Taliban, and certain groups within the Taliban. Um, now, what was the other question, sorry? The, the, ter the, the ter ceding ter territory to the, uh, to the Taliban? No, this is a, this is totally, uh, this, this means the breakup of Afghanistan. And no Afghan, whether you're Tajik Afghan or Hazara Afghan or Pashtun Afghan, will accept or tolerate the breakup of this country. You know, there's a very, very strong sense of uh, statehood and nationhood in Afghanistan. You know, it's not a new country. It wasn't just born yesterday. Uh, it has a very long history. These people have lived with each other and uh, alongside each other for centuries. Uh, and they're very proud of their history, and they're pr very proud of what they've accomplished uh, uh, during very difficult, challenging periods. And the latest one was, you know, the Soviet invasion. It was the Afghan people together, regardless of ethnicity, that really came together and fought the Soviets. Others helped, but it was the Afghans who paid the, the biggest price. You know, we lost, as was mentioned, more than a million people. And it started, uh, you know, again, during a time when uh, most of us are, are, are still alive to, to, to remember that. Um, so th this is, this is, um, this is uh, wishful thinking, and it's very impractical, and it would, it would not make anything easy in that region of the world. It would make it much more difficult for anyone if Afghanistan was divided into two or three different, even if it's de facto. There are even problems with thinking about federalism in Afghanistan, let alone you know, a, a, a de jure sort of breakup of the country. So, so I don't see that in, in the picture. It would be much more problematic for Afghanistan and for the region overall. Ryan, Peter, would you like to comment on that? Oh, I think it's going to be the final question. I think that was great. Yeah. All I would say is go to waronthorocks.com sometime today. Just launched shameless. today. Shameless, shameless, <laughs> shameless plug. It's not my last Any remark. Final no, comments? OK, well, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to be part of such an intelligent and my, it's a handsome panel of gentlemen. <laughs> and uh, thank you for your, uh, for your time, and thanks for coming. Thank you. It was great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.